Dead. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What a year this has been already, and what a year it will be. Yes, we have record numbers of battle code registrations and record numbers of people in attendance. Wow. I'm glad to see everybody here today on such a cold day, here to get some battle code and here to get some food. Yeah, well, the food will be here later. You just have to sit through the lecture for now. That's right. So, uh, so what are we going to do today, James? Uh, this is James. I'm Max. I don't know if you've seen me before. Mm -hmm. I think you've, they've probably seen you more than they've seen me. Yeah, well, because I've just been doing this forever now. Yeah, you're, you're the icon. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go over the specs today. The game is unfortunately not going to be released until tomorrow at midday. We want to give you guys extra time to stew over what's going on in the specs. That's right. So this will give everybody the chance to actually read through the specs document instead of reading just the beginning and then forgetting about the rest of it. Maybe get rid of some of the questions we get of like, you know, can robots move? That sort of thing. Yeah. So let's jump straight into it. Uh, oh, oh, no, no. Administrative stuff first. You go over that. Okay. So let's talk about Battle Code as a class. How many people here are registered for Battle Code? Uh, for six for six credits. Remember, you can you can register and get six credits, and it's it's actually no bad no bad thing if you don't do well. Mm -hmm. So so how do you get those credits? You remember how? To get the credits of the game, you have to beat an example player from the devs, which is an extreme challenge, and you're going to have a lot of trouble doing it. I it's promise. It's actually somewhat no, easy. No, it's really hard. Don't believe him. It's 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 awful. So we'll release the reference player in a couple of weeks, and uh, and if you can't beat it, that's no problem either. All you got to do is write a strategy report and send it to us, and if it's even remotely good, then we'll call it good and we'll give you full credit. If you decide it's not your thing, you can drop it, and we'll just we'll just drop you from the class. So there's this is pass or no record, basically. Yeah, it really is. Uh, so we make it easy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's there's really no pressure. This is about fun, and just you know a little bit of thousands of dollars of prize money. That's right, Ab absolutely. So the, if you're in the top place, you get like like ten thousand dollars or something. Well, mm -hmm. your team, you have to divide it among everybody. So mm -hmm. that might be a reason for you to. Um, be alone in a team. No, I mean, teamwork and being in a good team is what makes Battlecode fun. It's true, it is. All right, well, I guess that's pretty much everything oh, administrative. Well, I guess there's, there's one other thing, which is that there's a bug bounty program this year, but we're gonna talk about that more tomorrow when you have your hands on the software. Yeah, and what it means, what it will mean is... Basically, if you can find a security issue in our system, you'll get an award, no questions asked. Well, if you're the first person to report that particular issue, you'll get an award. Yeah, you can't just go to your friend and be like, what issue did you find? Okay, I'll submit the same thing. So that doesn't count. Yeah, that's not cool. So the battle code is put on wholly by students. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got me and the other battle code devs over here and James mm -hmm. and it's a couple, just a couple devs over in building two redirecting people because we had to move rooms because there's so many of you. And, and it's just a colossal amount of work. And this year, even more so because we support Different languages! Yeah! This year, you can use Python and Java. You may have heard about that before. You can also use Rust. You can use C. You can use C++. And you can support use a wide variety of other languages that we will be polling to select later in the week. That's right. You support trying carpets. Uh, if you really want to do that to yourself, you're welcome to try. So. Let's go into the ba uh, battle code specs for this year. Yeah, what is what is this year's game? What's going on? Uh, can they see this on the stream? That's right. Well, they, uh, we, I'll, I'll press Shift F5 and I'll check, the and they've got it. Go to the website. Yeah. Oh yeah, the specs are on the website, guys. You should read it. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to battlecode.org, and the specs will be under materials, presumably specs and software, and you can view the game specs here. Okay, and there it is. So I'll zoom in a little bit. How's that font size? I guess it's looking okay. Legible. Okay, uh, well, I guess I'll just perform this. So, very recently, the galaxy-renowned robot historian BCH1137 published 18 volumes covering the happenings of 28th century Earth. These volumes, occupying 11 petabytes of data, tell the story of every bullet fired in robot combat. He points out a startling discovery. That is, that all these bullets were fired on Earth. Yes, both of the major political parties, the Research Engineering Division, red, and the Branched Logistics Union of Electronicists, Blue, quickly realized the implication that bullets could also be fired on other planets. Now, the race is on to depart the aging planet Earth and colonize the next best planet, Mars. Indeed, BCH-1137 issued a prediction that no robot worth its silicon can doubt that the Earth itself will be rendered utterly inhabitable to robots in a short time. In utterly inhabitable. Completely inhabitable. If you're still on Earth at the end of the game, you lose. The story of armed conflict between red and blue, spanning across two planets, 
is being written now. That was really good. Thank you. Thank I, you. I appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Very good. <laughs> So, so in this in this year, we don't run the code on the robots individually mm -hmm. anymore. We're we're giving you well, maybe maybe let's take a step back. Okay. Okay. So in Battle Code, you write code that controls virtual robots that fight a big war. This year, they're fighting a war to get away from Earth onto Mars. Additionally, this year the control scheme is quite different from in previous years. In previous years, every robot would be running its own program. In this year, the, there's one program for your entire team on each planet. So one program controls every single one of your bots on Earth, and it has correspondingly more time and bytecode. That's right. Although in this case, we've sort of thrown out the whole question. Remember all of the point of using Java was we had this instrumenter and we could count the number of bytecode. We could, we could sort of give a score mm -hmm. to compute time. That's, that's all out the window now. We've if, got any language. If about. only there was some other cross-language system for determining whether things took time. For example, Time. time itself. Yes. Oh, amazing. So we're going to use the time it takes to determine whether your code has used too much time. Mm -hmm. Brilliance. Um, all right. So I'm going to go over victory. So, so ultimately, winning the game of bat winning a particular game of battle code comes down to first of all having the highest combined value. Well, first of all, if you can eliminate your opponent's team, well, that's clearly going to win. Mm -hmm. So you could you could beat them on Earth and never have to touch Mars. Yes, that's true. Uh, but if you can't beat them in 1,000 rounds, then the team wins that has the highest combined value of units or that has the most of this collecting resource called carbonite. Mm -hmm. um, and if those two, ties, those two are tied, which will probably happen once or twice in the entire competition, the remaining winner will be decided by PRNG. So, so we've got these four teams because now your, your player is just... Uh, is, is your whole team, he sees right. the whole team. It's sort of like a guy playing StarCraft. He can see the whole team. It's not code running on each robot anymore. And the only separation within a given team is that there's a separate code running on Mars and on Earth. Mm -hmm. Did you say that already? I sort of. Well, now, now it's... Let, let, let's keep going. Okay, so we'll move on. This is what carbonite is. This is the thing that you use to build everything. And it starts out in deposits everywhere on Earth and mm -hmm. in some parts uh, on Mars. It can, it can land by asteroids. Mm-hmm. Um, the game is played on a rectangular grid of a size between 20 and 60, question mark? 20 and 50, um, square. So the maps are completely symmetrical. You will start in a completely symmetrical position to your opponent. The resources of the map will be symmetrical. The obstacles of the map will be symmetrical. Um, Although on Mars, there's no such restriction because after all, you don't start on Mars. So more on that later. So, so we've got these uh, we got these maps, and any given game is played on two maps. There's a map for Earth and a map for Mars, mm -hmm. and any given tile on that map can be uh, can be passable or impassable, and have a certain amount of carbonite on it. All right, uh, moving on. And and what's nice this year is that you get that map at the beginning. In previous years, we've heard people say, "Oh, you know, I've got this rush strategy, and it's a coin flip whether I win or lose." because I don't know if I'm on a big map or a little map, mm -hmm. or if it's, uh, if it's got a lot of walls in it, or if it's very open. Mm -hmm. And this, this time, you get the whole map, and because this is a time-based game, that means that the first turn, you can spend five whole seconds of computing, if you want to. Mapping uh, out the map. Mapping out the deciding, what am I going to do yeah. with this map? We'll talk more about how the timing system works later in the specs, I think. Yeah, we'll get to it in a minute. So you start with one to three workers on Earth, and it's from there you start building things mm -hmm. that, uh, that bring you elsewhere. All right, we'll, we'll talk about what workers are later, too. Okay, so should we move on to this? Uh, yes. Okay, so, um, yeah, we talked about this. Squares, carbonate deposits, which you can walk over and mine. They give you resources. You can use that resources to build things. And according to our uh, robot historian, BCH, at the start of round 750, Earth does in fact suffer a massive flood, and it does destroy everything on the planet. Mm -hmm. So you really have to get to Mars, and that gets us the question, how do we get there? Yes. Let's, let's maybe scroll down. All right. So to get to Mars, you're going to need to build a bunch of different kinds of units. There's two kinds of units overall, robots and structures. Robots are like people. They can walk around and move and, and shoot things. Structures are like not people. They kind of sit there. You can, you can live in them. You're, in, you're inside one right now. Um, you know. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's two types of structures, rockets and factories. Factories can build units, and rockets can contain units and then take them to Mars. 
that's the exciting part. And also, I think from Mars back to Earth, although that's kind of a risky strategy. I don't see what the point would be yeah. of going back. Oh, you can't. Never mind. I'm, I'm lying to you. Um, you can't go back. That's frightening. I mean, there's no rocket fuel on Mars. I think it would be true for, for humans as well. The first humans to go to Mars, I don't think they're going to be able to come back. <laughs> maybe that's a little dark. Maybe, maybe that is a little bit dark. But they're going to live there happily. That's all I'm saying. It's too nice there. They got curry with extra, I you mean, know, Matt, Matt Damon wasn't very happy in that, that That's movie. true. No, he, he wanted anything but to come back. I mean, he wanted anything but to leave. You get the point. He wanted yes, to go. Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> so... So, uh, yeah, this is, this is the same as before. If the health of a unit gets to zero, it's removed from the game. Every robot has a unique random integer ID. Um, da -da -da, useful for, like, cache maps and stuff. So here's the different robots this year. We've got a worker, a knight, a ranger, a mage, and a healer. All right. I, you want me to go over them? Uh, sure. All right. So workers are your, you know, workhorses. They can walk around and build things. Um, they can mine carbonite. And... Um, you know, they can, they move pretty slowly. Well, they move about average speed, actually. Um, and they can also replicate, and I haven't read that part of the spec. So if they, if they replicate, they can make another worker for slightly cheaper than if you made it from a factory, okay. uh, is what this says here. Right. You got the knight, which is a melee unit. You got the ranger, which is a ranged unit, though it has a minimum range. You can um, use the mage, which is also a sort of ranged unit, but, but no, it's actually like more of a basher. It's an AoE unit. It's, a, it's AoE. It, it has a... Uh, it has an area of effect damage, and uh, and then you got the healer, which can which can heal units. Mm -hmm. And what's cool? Look at these cool graphics. This year's client is probably the most visually attractive one to date. Not that I've seen it. Yes. But you've seen it. Yes, and it's very beautiful, and we'll probably show it to you at the end of the lecture if we can get our shit together. You see, we have a lot of devs this year, and from that basis, we, we took on some very ambitious goals. Yes. And that's why this year's battle code is going to excite and entertain and basically overall cause your hair to stand on end more just, so than others. Just all of January, the entire month, you're just going to be shivering. It's going to be so awesome. A, it might be from the weather. It would, yeah, I mean, I, I prefer to take credit for it, though. Right. Um, all right, so uh, you can also run the great, if you're worried about, um, like, you, you have a not too beefy computer, you can run the client in very low graphics mode, it's not very heavy. Um, but if you do have a big beefy computer, you can, you know, turn those graphics up to max, woo, look at all those pixels. All right. Um, so we've got these uh, structures we already talked about. How do you build a structure? Well, you can get a robot to put down a blueprint. And the blueprint has a quarter of the maximum health of the structure. And then you get the worker to build the blueprint afterward. And I guess he hits it with a hammer until it's done. Yeah, sort of like classic, uh, you know. Like, uh, Every game ever. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Age of Empires, you know, that sort of thing. Um, both structures have garrisons, which is a holding space for eight robots. Um, so if a factory builds a soldier or a knight or whatever they are, it, it builds it into its own garrison, and then it has to ungarrison the soldier for it mm -hmm. to get out, which is kind of neat, because in, in previous years, you know, it's... You just it, sort of threw it out on the map somewhere, you, and you didn't really have much control you over You couldn't it, hide. You know? I mean, imagine you get all these units, you could hide them in the building, yeah. and, you don't, and then they pop out suddenly. Just a bunch of knights stacked up on top of each other. Yeah. Um, That's like a special move right there. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can use that strategy without even having to pay me royalties. Imagine that. The generosity. <laughs> just, just never having your units leave the factory. That's, yeah, it's a You heard it here first, folks. It's like a, it's pacifism. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, you can unload units and, and so on. And what's also crazy is if the uh, factory or the rocket gets destroyed... Everything in it will die. Yeah, unfortunately... Um, that's about how they, they accidentally made it so the doors open the wrong way. So when they're trying to get, that's also really dark. Yeah, maybe we should move on. <laughs> okay, but they're just robots, people. It's fine. Uh, I mean, they're clearly sentient if they are like writing his story. Oh, well, you make a point there. Okay, moving on. Um, We've got a research uh, tech tree, and what what I love about the tech tree this year mm -hmm. is that you don't have to fight for tech in contest with other resources. Mm -hmm. it's, it's its own separate thing. You can just research something and it's for free. Mm -hmm. So you have a team-wide research queue, well, a team-wide research queue for each planet. I think research is shared between planets with a delay. Uh, no delay? Yeah, the, no delay. Oh, the research is shared between planets faster than the speed of light. That's right. Um, and um, yeah, research costs nothing. It just takes time. And um, you can, there's a, there's a bunch of different upgrades. Each unit type has four upgrades you can research. Uh, later upgrades cost pro cost progressively more and are progressively better. The, the thing that, that I like to think about when we talk about how research goes immediately between the two planets is that movie Interstellar where they say that love transcends the boundaries. But they're not quite right. I think we've got an addendum to make. It's more that 
research transcends the boundaries of space and time. Slightly faster walking speeds it's a, are the true force of power in the universe. Exactly. Uh, uh, it's research. Yes. Okay, so, but, but communications, on the other hand, if you're going to talk to somebody, well, no, 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 that's, that's not as good as research or love. Yes. Um, so communication is going to be less important this year because you have shared unit and shared control between all your robots. So a lot of your shared logic can just be like data structures. Um, but if you do want to send messages between the planets, you have a 100, is it a byte or integer? 100 100, integer array. 100 integers. Um, you can write to the array, and 40 turns later, 40 turns? Did that change? 50. 50 turns later, the, uh, the other planet will be able to see it. So there is a delay between the planets, unless you're using research. So, you know, if yes. you do manage to, like, use research to encode, like, a small bit stream, I will be very impressed. Um, <laughs> oh, man. All right. That would be something. Yeah. Um, you also have shared vision on your map. So if one robot can see a spot on your map, every robot can see a spot on your map. That's, of course, not true for the enemy planet. You can't see anything on the other planet at all, except for, like, the initial state of it. You, know, you sort of have long-distance scans is the idea. I've got a question right here. Uh, can you research if you have no units? The question is, can you research if you have no units? Well, the game's going to end, presumably. Uh, if you have a structure. If you, if you have a structure. Well, structure is a unit. Yeah, structure is a unit. Okay, so like if you, you have, have no have units, the logic will not be running on that planet. And if you have no units at all, then you'll be dead. I mean, like, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're on Mars and, you have, and you're nothing on Mars, can you use that to research? I think you've only got one research queue for the whole team. You have one research queue? your entire team which is shared between both Earth and Mars. All right. Yeah. So one research queue which is shared between Earth and Mars. That's so you can't take team. advantage of the idea that, um, that there's nobody wrong. there to research again. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, whatever. It's all the same. We're going to change all these again. So almost everything we say has got to yeah. be taken with the whole thing of Morton Salt. There's at least one unit, one, one unit ability in here that's horribly broken. And I, you know, I, I ask you all to find it as quickly as you can because you're definitely going to. Um, well, there's a sprint tournament too. So the first person to find the broken units Right, is going to end yeah, up well, you, you can you can use the strategy and you'll be happy, and then we'll nerf it to hell. So you know, have fun. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, yeah, we've talked about communication between the two teams because remember, my team mm -hmm. is going to have a, a separate program running on Earth and on Mars. So that's the communication going between those mm -hmm. two. Uh, one more. I'll allow you one more question. Okay. Uh, can you destroy a factory to to regain resources? Uh, can uh, no, I don't. Think I don't yeah, I don't think you can cancel. I mean, you buildings. can destroy a factory if you really don't want it there, but like. That's, Once that's you up to you. do something, those resources are gone and will never be refunded. If your opponent destroys this building, they will not be refunded. So it sounds like it's a no refunds policy yeah, in general. You, you put the resources in, you're not getting them back out. Isn't that the same as Black Friday? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just wondering. I, I hardly go I mean, out I feel to, like just, I guess, to shop. Right, because they don't have a return policy. Okay. Yeah, it. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I okay. just I don't really Oh, you thought... Well, okay. I don't shop that much either, so that's why I was wondering. <laughs> all right. So, so we got we got some data on the workers and and all these other guys. So here's here's the replicate ability for the worker. You can produce another worker at full HP in an adjacent square, and the cost is deducted from the resource pool. I think probably this has a cooldown. Uh, I got a nod. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't just use this exclusively. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd want to also use the factory if you if you need to hurry up and build a bunch of them. In fact, pretty much every ability has a cooldown. You can use it, and then you'll have to wait a few turns before you can use it again. We got the knights here. Um, they they've got some armor, and so they reduce all the incoming damage by five hit points. And you can research a javelin for them to do damage at range. Uh, mm -hmm. This one's my fa This one's one of my favorite units. I. The ranger, see this active ability here? You can, uh, you can research their snipe ability, and it means that if they just sit still for 50 turns, then they can attack a square uh, that's anywhere on the map, from anywhere on the map. You don't even have to be able to see it. I, I'm just going to build like six or seven of these guys, or maybe as many as I can support. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to have them fire at random into enemy territory. That's a, that's a strategy. I think, I think it, it's going to work against people who don't move around too much. That's true, if you leave your units in the starting places. It's not going to work well against Example Funk's player then, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got uh, mages, and they, they have uh, splash damage, okay? And then they've got blink, which I guess they can teleport to any location within their active ability range. So all these ranges and stuff, these will be stored somewhere in the mm -hmm. game so that you can access them programmatically. Yeah, there, there will be a sort of constant interface where you can be like, mage.range, and we encourage you to use that because the range will change over the course of the competition. Right, you don't so want to just type in 50 or whatever, because then you're going to get an error. Yeah, or um, you're not going to get an error and your code's just going to be broken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, okay, now we've got, we've got healers. Okay, they can, they heal themselves one health per round, and they can, uh, 
they can reset the cooldown of a targeted robot on your team. So, uh, so if you use maybe a unit that has a really great ability, mm -hmm. like a javelin, maybe. Yeah, or the sniper. Then you could use the healer to reset that. And just have a big nest of snipers and healers just waiting there, shooting constantly. Okay, let's look at the rocket here. Uh, the rocket, it doesn't have very much vision range, uh, but of course it can launch. It only gets one launch, and that's it. It's a single-use rocket. I mm -hmm. don't think uh, Elon Musk would be particularly proud. I mean, I don't know. He'll be, he'll be dead. Oh, because well, because it's like twenty eight hundred. Yes, it's right. Like well, we'll all be dead. Okay, of natural causes. Yes, okay. of course. After a long and happy yeah. life, of, you have me a little of, of building rockets and stuff. Yes, yes. What a what a lovely man. Uh, so he'll he'll uh, I mean the rocket <laughs> he'll take off and it, it, when it lands if it lands on a robot the robot's killed. Um, you do you set the target at the beginning of the launch or at the end? At the beginning. You set the target at the beginning of the launch. You just say I want to land on this target on the other planet, and then you're committed. Yeah, because it's, gonna, the, it's the, gonna land. The rocket can sense like where the map is of Mars, and it can say, what's the best tile for me to land on? And then pick that one. And unfortunately, if you and your ally, or you and your opponent both have the same idea, you know, you can have rockets landing on one another. Yeah, like that's, that's up to you. Um, I mean, you could also try and land it on like the enemy factory, you know, just to score those extra kills, but you know. It's gonna be kind of hard because you know the long delays and stuff. Speaking of delays, so you can't just go between the planets and have a fixed amount of travel time on the rocket. There's different times of the year. There's different, you know, right. approaches. Right, the Earth and Mars, they're like going around at different speeds. You know that sort of thing. So we've approximated that by giving you a sign function, which means that sometimes the delay for going from one planet to the other is more, and sometimes less. Yes. Just you know, just you know, a little bit more of a wrench in the works. Uh, just to just to make your your number crunching that much more fun, right? Uh, because we're kind like that. That's right. Now the, the the sinusoid that you saw there, it's not finalized. You know, maybe it'll have a different period or a different mm -hmm. amplitude. It'll probably be a little more jagged. Yeah. Right. But you'll know it, so it'll be available to your uh, code at the beginning, so you can programmatically decide mm -hmm. when to launch to Mars. Yes. All right. Um, factories. So. You can, uh, so workers build factories, they're somewhat expensive, but they're really healthy, they can't see very far, but they can build guys. Like, pretty much describes it, right? It takes five rounds to build a robot, and then it spawns in the garrison, like we said before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at the uh, research trees. We've got a separate tree for each unit, and, uh, and remember the idea of research is it doesn't cost you anything. You just put the items on the research queue, and then some guy in the sky mm -hmm. uh, sits at some lab bench in the sky, and he... Well, at any rate, it might be in the ground. But the point is, he sits there and he works on it at a specified rate, which is a constant for both teams, independent of how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then, eventually, science pops out. Right. Science pops out, and then that's transmitted to corporeal beings. Yes. Just like the real world. <laughs> Just like the real world. <laughs> All right. Uh, right. So workers, they can, uh, they can mine carbonite faster, or they can uh, repair things and construct things faster. Knights, they can, uh, they can put more armor on. Uh, it sort of begs the question why they didn't do that to begin with. I mean, it's heavy. That's a good point. <laughs> they have to be convinced. Even more armor, okay, well, then they become even more tanky. And then you've got the javelin ability. Okay, let's see the ranger tree. We've got uh, decrease the movement cooldown, increase the vision range, uh, and use the snipe ability, which I, maybe is going to be the worst ability ever, but I'm still going to use it. Then we've got the mage tree. Um, yep, yeah, you can... Um, increase your damage and just continue increasing your damage and eventually you can blink. Uh, originally in one of the design specs for this uh, unit we had it increasing damage and reducing health at the same time. And we decided that was too... For some reason we took that out. Maybe, so, but the name glass cannon remained. Mm -hmm. I mean they're still not very like... They're not very tanky are they? How, yeah. many, how many hit points do they have? I think 15. Should I, should I scroll up? 15? That's like nothing. Mage, no, uh, max health. Okay, a hundred. So they've got some. They've got some. Wait, yeah, I'm hit points, but looking at the wrong field of the thing. Uh, maybe you were looking at the range. Oh, we forgot to mention for people who haven't done battle code before, when we refer to the range of something, like if I have an attack range of sixteen, mm -hmm. that means that I can hit a unit that's four tiles away, because we give all the ranges in squared units. Mm -hmm. So that just makes it so that you don't have to um, take the square root all the time, which could actually be pretty expensive. I mean. Even if we gave it... That was it, the logic, or I think that's honestly kind of silly, but you it's, know, it's, it's pretty a tradition darn, at this point. It's, it's pretty silly. I think we have to say it's tradition, because after all, they could have just multiplied the range we supply, squared that, and then oh, compared them. That's like an extra instruction at the start of the program, though. That's a long time. Well, that's a good point. 
Um, Never mind. It wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> All right. So we got the um, healer's tree. We can increase the healing ability. Um, and we can unlock the overcharge ability, which uh, mm -hmm. eliminates the cooldown for uh, another robot that it targets. Mm -hmm. We got the rocket tree. So you can't even build a rocket straight off the bat. You have to research it first. Mm -hmm. So you pay 100 to research it. You can get the boosters to reduce the travel time by 20 rounds. And, uh, and then you've got increased capacity so you can garrison more units in that rocket. So you could choose to never research rockets at all and just go really hardcore at attacking your opponent, but you better have a lot of confidence in your, your micro. Yeah, and you better, you better beat them before they get a guy in a rocket, because if they do, then you're and done you're, for. You're, you're, you lose. You lose a turn 700. I think it's pretty exciting here that, you know, in the past we've had these sort of like snowball-y games sometimes where like you build a, a, miner, a mining depot that allows you to build another mining depot and then you just sort of ramp exponentially. Right, or the... Or the, or the Infinite zombie floods last year, or but, two years ago. But in this year, in this year, uh, one of the things you can do is you can put a guy in a rocket, and then much later he's like on another parallel path. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, he's got an advantage over there, but not over here. It's like a big strategic. There's a, layer. Lot, there's a lot going on this year. Yeah. I hope you're getting that impression. Okay. Timing overview. All right. So um, now we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about timing. So there's no idea of byte code anymore. There's no assembly instruction counting. It's just by time. It works based on. Um, the same way chess timers work. You know how that works. Basically, you start the game with a pool of time. I don't know exactly what the number is. I think it's... Depends on what type of match you're playing, like lightning or... Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, this one. Initial pool of 10 seconds. I thought you were talking about chess. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I was. Right. Um, well, yes, the game... but, but in this game, you start with 10 seconds of time. Um, every turn, you can use as much or as little of the time as you want. But if you run out of time, you cannot do any more moves in that game, which means you will probably lose. Oh, I thought, you lo I thought you lost immediately, like in chess. I think, no, that was, the, that was the compromise we made. Oh, I see, I see. So you just get to do nothing. Yes, so you're, you're kind of stuck. So um, you do want to keep your timing low, but um, you can, you know, you can, you can use a little extra in the beginning if, the, if you want. Also, for every turn that passes, you gain a small amount of additional time. Um, so your pool will steadily increase as more turns pass in the game. Um, now, if your computer at home is running a little slow, you don't have to worry about that so much mm -hmm. because this year we're offering an unprecedented amount of compute resource available to you. Am, am I not right? Uh, we're, we're sort of doing that. <laughs> well, we, we have scrimmage servers. Right. When you run a match on our scrimmage server... It will be the same time that it will be in the tournaments because it will be the same servers because that's how that things work. Right. It's all, it's all bundled together. It's all simplified. And we're hoping to keep scrimmage times down. We're hoping to get you... Our goal this year was to get everyone to be able to run a scrimmage game every 10 minutes. We'll see if that's actually what we end up doing, but you know, that's what we're aiming for. So you know, cross your fingers. Yeah, lots of compute resources um, are available to yes. us, so hopefully of, they all come lots through. Lots of cloud servers. Hopefully we won't be hit too hard by Meltdown. Haha, I love Intel. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's talk about cooldowns and heat. The smallest unit of time is one turn. Mm -hmm. um, but not every action can be performed every time, so now you've got a delay for everything that you want to do. Right. There's uh, a cooldown. So you have heat that builds up, and then you have to wait for the heat to go away, just like with real machinery. But, right? So robots can only move when their movement heat is less than 10, and they can attack when their attack heat is less than 10. And both heats decrement by 10 at the start of every round to a minimum of zero. So when, when something says a cooldown of 20, I don't think that means 20 turns. I think that means it's got 20 heat associated with it. Mm -hmm. And so when that's going to cool down faster than that. So you don't have to think like, oh, geez, I only get 10... Well, it's 20 cooldown, and I've only got 50 yeah. moves in the whole map. I'm not going to get to the other side. No, no, you get 500 moves every You get 500 well, moves. Well, not, I mean... If you start at the beginning. But you're going to get flooded. So really, you get something less than 700 over two moves. Oh, yes, that many. Right. Unless you get in the rocket, in which case you well, can't yeah, but get you're still, you're not going to, like, land for a while. Oh, that's true. You can't move when you're in the rocket. It's very cramped. Yes. Yeah, in fact, your, your robots in the rocket can't do anything, so you shouldn't spend too much computer. It's just like me in the plane. <laughs> I try to get work done, and I just sit there. Yeah, you just, like, it's designed to make you uncomfortable. It's, it's pain. It's I, great. I think our, our simulation here is excellent for that reason. It's an <laughs> yeah, that, that, and that reason alone. Yes, correct. Location. Um, uh, so there's, there's multiple planets, and a, a unit is not necessarily on, on the map. It could, it's, like we're saying, it's not necessarily on Earth or on Mars. It could be in a, in a rocket. Um, mm -hmm. So there's two different ob there's two different uh, classes here. One's location, and the other is map location. And you'll see more of this tomorrow when we go over the actual API. Um, but essentially, map location is an X Y planet tuple, and location is it might be a map location, or it could be I'm in a garrison, or it could be I'm in space, or it could be I'm dead. So 
it's additional information on top of that. Um, and you have like nice methods you can use to access that information. Yeah, so, um, so we got a little glossary of terms here at the end, and that basically covers the specs document. And I think we should open up to questions before we go to some cool examples. Yes, that sounds good. Questions about this year's specs? We should probably check this Twitch. Uh, and uh, yes, back there. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think you can't ungarrison a unit if, if it's uh, yeah if it's all blocked up. Can you access the asteroid pattern in advance? Yes, um, yes. it's uh, specified here in the specs okay. that the pattern of asteroids which fall on Mars and cause it to replenish in carbonite uh, is accessible to the user at the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. I'm just repeating the question because people on chat can't hear. Yes, um, are subliminal, right? Yes, they are. They're, they're, they take time. Um, and you can also access the entire game map at the beginning of the turn, to say that again. And you can also access the initial locations and stats of every robot on the map, including the enemy team. Um, I like yeah. how we get advertisements in our own I Twitch know, chat. right? I'm trying to watch my own Twitch chat here. All right. Um, um, okay. All right. Other questions? What happens if Oob is this far that he had no units in Miles and he never walked into transit? Uh, you're still alive, but you can't do anything. Uh, well, at least until you land. Yes. Um, yes. No, you'll just be stuck there. Um, all right. Okay, so I think we should move on. I've got some pretty cool Python examples. Uh, how many people, let me just, I want to gauge uh, sort of how much people know about Python already, because if, if you already know it, then we'll just jump ahead mm -hmm. to, to just other examples. So who here has, has done Python before? Everybody's done Python. And who here is planning to write your battle code player in Python? All right, Not wait, wait, wait. I'm curious, what about Java? All right, what about other languages? Hmm. So there is actually a spread. There's a mix. That, that is kind of a mix. Yeah. So I thought I would just open up some of the examples that I had. Yeah, sure. And point to how they work. Yeah, let's, let, let, let's, let's do some programming. Um, and we're going to show you some examples of stuff using our API, but we don't actually have the code for you yet. You'll have to wait again, I repeat myself, until tomorrow at midday, which is when it will release. Um, and also, the actual scrimmage servers will release uh, what, what did we say? Sometime. Sometime next week. And the sprint tournament will be on. I'm, I'm flying blind here, guys. <laughs> what did you say? When is the sprint tournament? Like sometime next like Tuesday? Like sometime next Tuesday. <laughs> that means the scrimmage server will be up sometime this week. Yes. <laughs> Tuesday or Wednesday? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, is, on some computers, you have to type Python three to execute something using Python three. Uh, that's not how it's going to work. I know, I know, but I know. But if you're just using Python alone, yes. And on others, you type py dash three. Really? Yeah. <laughs> on this one, it doesn't work if I type Python three. You you would see it. Uh, let I, me try. Example I've never seen that before. Db. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Uh, so I've got a series of demos, uh, and this is one that I that I wrote, which has like. Um, gets us in the mood for space. So you've got this box here, which is in, uh, in beige. And then uh, depending on where you move it with the arrow keys, all these other little white boxes orbit it. They orbit around it. And you can sort of tear it up and turn this fabric into bits. I think it's kind of mesmerizing. It's, it's sort of fascinating, isn't it? And if you look closely at the very beginning, see these first few frames? I don't know if it shows up on the projector up there. Oh, the Mori pattern. pattern, exactly. You can see it expand outward as a set of rings so, or ripples. Uh, as the boxes take their first pixel moves. Can you see that? I think that's super cool. That's fascinating. Look at that. That's just, that wow, just, that I feel just drives, enriched. Don't that, you feel enriched? That drives me bonkers. So we've got examples like this on, our, uh, on the YouTube video for Python demos. Mm -hmm. And so even if you already know Python, maybe you'd uh, enjoy looking at one or two demos. I don't know. So let's look at the code that goes behind that. And, uh, and I'll just show a little thing about how it works. This is the whole thing. I use uh, the Pi game package to handle making this window and drawing boxes to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and all I do is I just make these game objects here, which are satellites. And at the beginning, I append them to a big list. And then as the game runs, I just use uh, g dot update somewhere where I update the uh, the objects that are in this support directory. And uh, and then I just calculate their positions based on um, Nice. On gravity. OK, let's move to the next example. Yeah. I'm and just if you're interested in building visualizations with Python or doing data analysis, there's going to be a lecture on that later in the next two weeks at some point. Once we release the schedule, you'll know exactly what date that is. And you should come, because it'll be fun. OK, here's another one. Um, this one is an example of cellular automata. 
And in this case, the way it works is this is the expression of a very simple rule. Uh, and that rule is that in the next frame, a pixel will be white if all of its neighbors, uh, if the sum of its neighbors is an odd number. Yes. And, uh, is that and life? Uh, it's like life. It's just a slightly different rule. And, uh, and one of the things that's super cool about this is that depending on the size of the window, the rate at which it resets itself and oscillates is different. Um, oh, by the way, there is a seed at the beginning. All of this expanding fractal complexity is the expression and ripple, outward ripple, of a single impulse in the middle, where I'm, I'm seeding the, ce the center tile with ones, and that makes all of this happen. Without that, none of it would happen. We hope this is getting you guys in the mood for doing some large generative scale coding. That's right. Let's change the, uh, let's change the size, and there's a... There's a way of making, um, making this not hang the command window if you're going to write, run a Python program. Mm -hmm. You type py, uh, Python W, but I don't know if that works with the py command. Hopefully, I don't think it's going to. I think it's just going to give me an error. Oh, it did. It worked. I just guessed huh. the answer. So I can open that one. And see, I love being distracted and mesmerized. So I'm going to make this one a different number. OK, so that's a different size guy. And then I'm going to bring up another one. Uh, and this one will have uh, a weird number in it here, like uh, 67. And uh, 33. Okay, there we go. We got another another guy going. Okay, so now I'm ready to show the next example while these all run. Um, okay, I think you should just leave those running for the rest of the yes, lecture. Yes, I think I, I intend to. I fully intend to. So uh, let's let's call up another one. Uh, we've Would just we looked at exa yeah. example four. We'll look at example four B. Huh? What? Rectangular one. Huh? What? Rectangular these are rectangular. This one's rectangular. So this one's cool. This one, I make a unit impulse at the beginning, and I allow the tiles to be uh, 0, 1, or 2. And I actually use this to generate game maps as well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I save it so that the uh, blue tiles are obstacles, and the, the colored tiles are like resource tiles, something like that. So you could do something like this to make a structured, programmatically generated game map that at the same time isn't just a bunch of random tiles. Mm -hmm. There's also going to be an integrated game map builder in the viewer this year, so you know it's easier to do than coding a JSON file like last year. I'm, I'm particularly excited about the map editor because I always like to make really silly maps with pictures of things in them. Yes. So that's, I, that's like the ideal type of map. That, yeah, we do that every time in Battle Code. People are like so pissed off because they're not well balanced maps. You know, if you guys if you guys make maps and submit them to us, then uh, and we like them, we could we could use them in the tournaments. Yeah, that might happen. You because, could do it. Because you know, people get all on their high horse about how maps should be better, but have they actually made maps? Have they submitted maps and you know pointed out what's good about them? You know, I mean they might do that more if we give them the tools to do that. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. Yes. That's uh, true. As soon as as soon as everything works. Okay, let's uh let's go to the next example, example four C dot P Y. I don't I think I, I might have to give it dimensions. Yeah, so it, it crashed. Let me give it dimensions. Okay, so this one looks almost exactly the same as the other one. I don't even remember what the difference is. Let's move on. <laughs> I, 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 I wrote these myself, but it wasn't long. It was, it was as many as a few days ago. Okay, have, have any of you played the game They Are Billions? No. No? Nobody? This is a clone of that game, but it doesn't fit in the window. So you can place structures and buy houses and money. At any rate, you can't play it because it doesn't fit in the window. It was a tremendous amount of effort, but I can't change the resolution, so we're moving on. <laughs> okay, what do we got next? What do we got next? We want to go over, like, we could do an example of what the game API is going to look like. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, all right. So, um, I, I Do you want to open up the... Uh, I'm going to get a file for you. Okay, so he's going to get a file, and we're going to look at one or two more uh, examples while he's doing it. Okay, let's see what kind of example we've got. Let's look at example six. Okay, so this is a this is a pathfinding example. Uh, you'll have this occasion where you've got a guy, and he needs to get to a destination. And uh, the way I've set this up is I can just draw with my mouse obstacles. So if you if you press spacebar, he'll just go to the place where he wants to go uh, by taking at each step the tile which is closest to the destination. And if I press um, I, then I'll reset it, and I can draw an obstacle and press spacebar. And in this case, the way he finds his way around the obstacles is using the algorithm called bug, or uh, bug pathing. Who's heard of bug pathing? Okay, a lot of people have, but there's going to be a little refinement that, unless you've seen Battle Code before, that you uh, haven't seen uh, before this. So let's uh, reset things. The way it's working is when it hits an obstacle, it follows it like a man in a maze with its hand on the side of the wall. 
and it'll follow that wall until it gets to a point that's closer than when it started, and then it'll exit that wall and go back into free mode. So if we put in a bunch of obstacles, uh, let's see if we can try to confuse it. Uh, it's never going to find the way if we do that. Uh, okay, maybe like this. Okay, let's try that. And Okay, let's see if it can find its way. Okay, see it bounced because it was in free mode, so then it went around the other side. Okay, so there it found the root. But you can see this isn't the most effective way to get from place to place. And, and so what I've done is I've introduced a refinement. And if you've seen last year's lectures, then you've already seen this before. But now I had to redo it in Python. And the advantage is you can go and get this example, the example6.py, and you can just copy it over into your battle code player if you want to. And you're going to want to when you see the refinement. If I press the R key, look at that. Boom. Wow, what happened? So see this little loop here? It cut it off. Why make a loop? It's just going to make the path longer. And see this point here where it had to make a right turn? It made the right turn earlier. Ah, so if I keep pressing the R key, it makes all the turns earlier, and then it just sort of gets in this sort of wiggly mode, like wacky inflatable flailing tube man. Do you guys know, wha who knows wacky inflatable flailing tube man? For those of you who don't, it goes like this. <laughs> Should I stop? Do you get the <laughs> Keep going. All right, so, so you see that at this point, it's found places where the paths are equivalent in length. And so it, uh, so it stops looking. Uh, sort of like me at my PhD thesis, you know, as soon as you find a certain, I shouldn't talk about that. Um, <laughs> so let's move on to the next example. All right, I also. Oh, have you got something to show? I've almost made something to show. Okay, you, you need another second? Okay, I'll keep going. Here's example seven dot py. Okay, how does this one work? This one does sort of a spreading fill. This is like a breadth first search, but it's simplified because it just writes an arrow at each location on the map. So let me put some more obstacles in here and reset it. So what it does is in the initial section, it's spreading these arrows outward. And whenever it draws an arrow to a tile, it draws it in the direction from which it came. So on this tile, I think an up arrow will be drawn. I'm wrong, it went to the right. So I, look, give me another shot at it, okay? Jeez, this one has got, it's bound to be an up air. Okay, I got it, okay, see, look how smart I am. So when it gets to the end, it follows the arrows back to the source. And one cool thing about doing the pathing this way is that now I've found a route from every tile to the source. See, look, if I wanted to find the route from here, I just follow the arrows backwards. So this guy, this guy, I'll, I'll, and then it would head there. So you can see that it, it finds the route from anywhere to anywhere else. Um, so I should probably reverse these and have the arrows emanate from the destination. That way if I've got 10 or 15 robots, they can all follow the arrows to the destination instead of, instead of just one of them following the arrows. Now in doing this, uh, here, do you want to see this go a couple more times? It's kind of mesmerizing. Okay, let's do it. Okay, maybe I'll make that a little longer and see what it does. Okay, now it goes this way. Oh, I could just watch this thing go all day. Well, no, I could probably watch it for six or seven minutes. So let's move on. Uh, we've got a pretty cool example where I assess the question of alternate paths. Because you might have thought, yeah, I mean, going from here to here, there's more than one way to do that that are all the same length. So if I press the space bar, you see they're spreading out. And then when it's going back, it goes and it shows all the paths. So how did I do that? So here, whenever I move from these white tiles into an empty tile, I can record more than one arrow. So in this case, this tile gets two arrows, and this tile gets two arrows. So when it's on its way back, it heads in all the directions of the arrows. And what I'm also doing, although it's not shown on the screen, is that I record on each tile the number of white tiles are in the batch at the moment. So right now, there's six white tiles. So I record a six in each of these tiles. And when it gets to here, I'm recording a two. And what that means is that this path data encodes how wide the path is. So if you had like 20 robots and you didn't want them to all funnel through one choke, mm -hmm. you, could, uh, you could use a method like this to count the width of the path. Right. Amazing. And do we want, I think we want to, before a final Q&A session, I want to show a little bit of what the game's going to look like. Let's do it. I'm ready. Uh, can you go to the Slack main channel? Can you like turn it to the normal thing? Yeah, so I'm going to hide this to uh, uh, Twitch plebs. And then I'm going to go over here to, uh, oh, it's already here, game dev. Uh, general. general. Okay, so don't read to... anything that you see on the screen. Yes, this is all secret. You're not looking. Okay, and then uh, uh, just just here, just here. I'll let you do it. Yeah. All right. Oh, I want to actually open the. 
All right, here we go. You can change it back now. And then we have an example an example file using the API in at the top. That's not it's not there. There we go. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Okay, so here is an example program that Battlecode might. Here's an example player for Battlecode this year. I'm not actually going to run this yet because we're not really seeing the code that runs it yet. But I'm going to show you around what the API looks like so you can get a sense and start thinking about how you're going to code your bots. So to start, you're going to import Battlecode, and you know it's nice to have short names. So we're going to do the Python thing and be like import Battlecode as BC. If you've ever used NumPy, you might be familiar with this, right? Okay. We're also going to import random. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how. Uh, hold control. No, that didn't work. Hmm. Edit. Format. Uh, File. Settings. Hmm. Maybe we should try a different editor. You could open it in uh, in Notepad plus plus maybe. Can yeah. You, can you control and zoom? Hold control. That looks. There we go. That's closer. All right. So I'm also going to import random because all starting battle code players. Uh, use a lot of random stuff. If you've ever seen an example Funks player before, you might be familiar with that. So, the first actual thing I'm going to actually do is I'm going to say game controller is equal to battlecode.gamecontroller. And what that does is it connects to the current game and starts it up and sets it up so that this is sort of like the robot controller you've used in past years. It's how you're going to access everything in the Battlecode API. Um, and you're going to use a special program to run this script, which will like set up everything for you and actually run a match that this will connect to. Now, I've got a question. Yes. What kinds of things can you import? Um, you can import a selection of Python libraries, which will be announced tomorrow. Um, you can also, in Java, import a selection of Java libraries. We're definitely going to expose at least NumPy and the Python standard library. Um, so if you wanted like a machine learning library or something crazy in there, mm -hmm. you could email us and get yeah, us yeah. to maybe Focus put it in? Focus and we might be able to put it in. Like if you want the you know, Fortran astrology library from 1960, we might put that in for you if you ask very nicely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's a life lesson. Ask nicely and you might get that astrology that you've always been looking for. Yes. Or you might not because it might be too hard to put in. Right. Right. So okay. next part is the while true. So this is the continuing loop that your robot code is going to run, one on mm -hmm. Mars and one on Earth. So it's a lot like battle code for past years. It's just that you're controlling all your robots instead of one of your robots. So I can print stuff. This will go out to the standard out, and it will also go and be shown in the viewer. So you'll be able to see, you know, on this turn I printed this thing. It'll help you debug, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to say, okay, so the current round on, wait, I typed this wrong. On, um, on Earth, for example, or on Mars, depending on which player this is running, because the same code will run depending on whether you're on Earth or Mars. And you could, you know, say, for example, if gc.planet is equal to um, bc.planet.earth, you know, presumably you'll want to do something more interesting than this, but this is a start, right? So hopefully you get a general sense. We have a bunch of little accessor methods that you can use to, use to learn about the world. Um, and a more, more salient accessor method is my units, which is going to give you a list of every single unit you own. And you could say, iterate through your units, choose, choose a random direction for each one of them, and if they can move in that direction, move in that direction. I don't know if you guys can follow that, though. I think, Does that make sense? I think it makes sense, especially because how many people here have already done battle code before? Yeah, there's like at least six or seven of them. Yes, like several people have done that before. Maybe we to, should stop talking about past years. Yeah, to people who um, to uh, who are new at either Battle Code or whatever, we have office hours after this lecture. Yes, it's true. Although We're there's gonna, not going to be much to talk about today because we've just shown you the specs. Well, we can get help you get things um, like set up Python and answer some questions about this year's game. Oh um, yes, that's true. One of the things that we didn't include in this code is um, try catches. So if you make a mistake using the API, it might throw an exception. And if you don't catch the exception, it's going to kill your bot. So it's a very good idea to put something like try around your entire program. <laughs> and this is extremely good software engineering methodology. And anyone who tells you otherwise has never programmed a real program. Um, I helped. There you go. Yes, yes, very nice. And in fact, you know, what if, for example, it could throw. I could also throw an error here and then miss all this. So you know, maybe I want to do an even 
Dancer one, right. You see, we're really good at programming. Yes. Um, don't actually do this in real code, but in battle code, you should, you should do this. This will save your life. Um, OK. So. James. Yeah? You mentioned that you lose. Yes. Well, you don't lose. You just stop playing. So if you don't include this try catch, remember that this code is controlling all of your units. So all of your units will immediately stop and just sit there. If they're on Earth, they will be flooded. If they're on Mars, they'll probably be killed. Yes, by asteroids. So it's it's uh, it's nice. We we're like a, a loving parent. Yes. We and we, we discipline uh, yes. in ways that help you learn. Yes, we encourage you to wrap yourselves heavily in body padding. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I think it's 7:55. Yeah. Um, we can all just hang out until pizza shows up. Who knows? when it's going to show up. It's scheduled to be 8 o'clock. Um, I, I saw a digit. A Q&A session is beginning now, so we open the floor to any questions that you might have about this year's game, and we thank you for, uh, for participating this year. So yes. thank you. Welcome to Battle Code. <laughs> Woo! I don't think we switch chat at all. No, we haven't, because I didn't want to look at that advertisement. They probably like have been saying all sorts of things. Yeah, how can I look at just the chat, but not the ad? I, it's not possible, I don't think. Okay. All right. I mean, well, we don't we need also, to. We can also anyway. pay attention to the, re the real people as well. Um, you can have like pizza emotes, maybe. All right. Uh, so, do people actually have questions? Because that's what we're here for. Okay, I got a question here from a poor player. Question, if runtime is limited, then would using C mm -hmm. over Python be a serious advantage? So. Uh, you're going to have an advantage if you use a faster language because you'll be able to execute more and more time. Oh, being set up. That will be correspondingly harder to use. So, like, if you're coding in C, you're going to be miserable because C is a really painful language to use. Versus in Python, everything is flowy and elegant. So, like, you know, that's a thing you could choose to do to yourself if you think you want to. That's cool. Yeah. I like the idea that um, putting yourself into yes. a situation um, of trouble. Also, um, we're going to execute your code using the PyPy interpreter, which is very fast. Um, you can expect it to execute about an order of magnitude slower than C, but that's still faster than Python, which is about two orders of magnitude slower than C. For those of you who are wondering how much longer till pizza, it's being set up, and we'll let you know as soon as it's available. Yes. And you know, we are great people down here. We set things up all for you, and we eat last. Yes. That's right. We, uh, we'll serve ourselves after you guys go, or at least I know I will. Yes, I'm not going to sleep for another 12 hours. Because we work so hard to make sure that this is good for you guys. Right. Another question, Java versus Python. So we measured it, and Java and Python are like similar speeds. Java is like maybe 1.5 times as fast, two times as fast. Um, but you're using PyPy, which is a fairly good optimizing compiler. So yeah, um, you're also welcome to shell out to C from your Python code. We might talk about that later in the lecture series. That's kind of going to be that would be kind of arduous, but it might be worth it. To shell out from your Python code. Yeah, like write a C program and call it from Python. Oh, okay, I didn't. That yeah. is in fact how our entire engine works. So. Yeah. Now, another thing that I'd like to point out is that um, we've got a fairly flexible lecture schedule, which is another way of saying we don't know what the hell we're doing. No, it's that we, we know exactly. We have a very well-planned lecture schedule. Excuse me. But what we mean is that we can accommodate for, um, um, for what is needed. So if you'd like a topic to be covered, you can talk to us about it. Yes, please. And we will be happy to take your views into account. You can see the client as soon as we release a preview of the client, which will happen probably sometime tonight. And then the actual thing will release tomorrow. Yeah, we can uh, we can assure you that the time that we spend uh, the time that actually we there are two sneak peeks of the client in Discord. If you want to go there, we have a Discord channel for all your chatting needs. You can find the link on the website. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, go to the Discord to see um, sneak previews. The JVM startup time is actually a good question. Um, we were thinking about that. We are going to eventually have you run a separate build script so that you don't need to worry about build time being part of your own time. But um, other stuff is, I mean, lots of your chatting needs, not all your chatting needs. OK, so it looks like um, some people are getting up to go get pizza. I didn't say that it was time yet, but I guess um, you don't want to be last. So yeah, it's good to acknowledge the fact that you have no power. Right. I, I I'm not in control you. of my life. No, I am really the wacky inflatable flailing tube man. <laughs> All right. Bone hurting that yes, yes. Um so um
currently there's just a starter package available for C. We can make, a, we'll, we're going to be polling as to what languages people want aside from the ones that we're currently offering and we'll implement those as we go. You're also welcome to implement your own version of the engine, although the, our current engine is like 15,000 lines of code, so like that's not really advisable. Every unit is OP. Every unit. Mm, yes. Indeed. Um, all right. Well, so we're all, um, you know, we're as we're wrapping. Uh, just post in general, and someone will link you. Oh, so maybe uh, he's saying we're in Discord. I think he, he means where where is our Discord link? Oh, um, the Discord is. You can find a link on the website somewhere. I don't know. I'm just a binary. I'll, I'll, I'll find it. Uh, let's go to battlecode.org. Presumably it's like up near the top. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's under FAQ. Somewhere? No. Uh, I don't remember what Gina said it was. Uh, no I really link. need to put an actual avatar there. There's no link. Yeah. Materials? This is mysterious. Schedule? Well, should we just get the link from here? Yeah. Where is it? I'm just going to search the website. Uh, pinned items on the Discord. General? Is it under general? I don't know. Hey, on. hey, group. Where's the Discord? Where's the Discord? Like, there's in general. No, where is it? Like, for people? Yeah. So, oh, on the website. You have to be logged in. Oh. Can you, you have to be logged into the website to see the Discord link, so you should log in first, and then you'll yeah. be able to see it. Uh, a Docker is essentially a container, I think, that can run Python. Yeah. 